1985, A View to a Kill premiered in theaters and did respectfully well at the box office, but it was obvious at that point that Roger Moore was getting a little long in the tooth to continue playing James Bond. Cubby Broccoli had to find himself another actor to fill Roger Moore's shoes, and many, many actors were given screen tests. Some of the finalists included Anthony Hamilton, an Australian model who was playing a spy on a show called Cover Up, Finley Light, and finally, Sam Neill, who got a screen test and apparently was one of the frontrunners to take the part. Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli were very interested in hiring him, but Cubby Broccoli didn't go for it. They eventually ended up settling on Pierce Brosnan, who was wrapping up his run on Remington Steel at the time. But fate had other ideas. Even though Brosnan had aced his screen test and indeed was hired to play the part, just as they were about to announce the fact that he had signed on, NBC decided to greenlight Remington Steel for another season. Now, what they thought was that they'd be able to parlay the notoriety variety that Brosnan would get from his James Bond movies into higher ratings for Remington Steel, but they didn't count on the fact that Cubby Broccoli was not interested in having Pierce Brosnan split his time between Remington Steel and James Bond. He famously said, Remington Steel will not be James Bond, and James Bond will not be Remington Steel. This ended up costing Pierce Brosnan the part, and in fact, his co-star Stephanie Zimbalist also lost out on a really famous role. She was supposed to play Officer Lewis in Robocop, but had to step down when Remington Steel got another season. And to add insult to injury, NBC actually ended up canceling the series after just a few more episodes. Pierce Brosnan would struggle over the next few years to find meaningful roles, and indeed would be at something of a low ebb when his career was kind of revitalized by movies like The Lawnmower Man and Mrs. Devfire, and of course, his time would eventually come as James Bond in Goldeneye. But that era is not upon us, not quite yet. When Pierce Brosnan wasn't able to play James Bond, they actually went to an actor that had been their first choice all along, apparently. Timothy Dalton was an actor that Cubby Broccoli had always had his eye on. In fact, he was approached to take over the role of James Bond in 1971 in Diamonds Are Forever, but he was only in his early 20s at the time and was far too young, or at least that's what Dalton thought. He was approached again before Octopussy and again before View to a Kill, but each time he was busy and in fact wouldn't have been able to do Living Daylights because he was off filming the movie Brenda Starr with Brooke Shields. It's crazy that Brenda Starr, a movie that ended up going direct to video something like four years later, almost cost Timothy Dalton the role of James Bond. Crazy. And finally, they had themselves a James Bond. He was a Shakespearean actor, and the film was tailored to suit him, meaning that he would pull on a darker approach to the character, one that was a lot more serious than Roger Morris. But the question remained, how would audiences react to this dark new direction? To give this Bond movie the edge that it needed, John Glenn, who had directed the three previous installments, was carried over and seemed good at making these kind of grounded James Bond movies, and in fact would be more grounded in Living Daylights than he had been since Free Your Eyes Only. John Barry returned to score the film, as did Desmond Llewellyn as Q, and Robert Brown, who was playing the new M at the time, or at least had been since Octopussy. One James Bond veteran, though, that did not get to continue her role was Lois Maxwell, who had to leave the role of Miss Moneypunny and was replaced by Carolyn Bliss, to have an actress, I suppose, that was more in line age-wise with Timothy Dalton. The film was a classy production with Mariam Dabo signing on to play the love interest while Yaron Crabbe and Joe Don Baker played the villains. In the movie, a recently defected KGB agent is kidnapped and Bond is called in to investigate, leading him to a plot involving the Russian war in Afghanistan and a multi-billion dollar opium smuggling operation. A much more serious premise than you'd gotten in James Bond films for quite some time. Now, Timothy Dalton really gets a bad rap as James Bond. Everybody loves Daniel Craig and his new darker Bond, but nobody ever gives Dalton any credit for basically taking the same approach 20 years before Craig ever slipped on his tux. Now, to be sure, The Living Daylights is nowhere near as dark as what would be Dalton's follow-up film, License to Kill, which is, I think, the movie that everybody kind of remembers him for. And that's a lot grittier than any James Bond movie that came before or would come after. This one is kind of a halfway point between the Roger Moore James Bond movies and the darker Dalton James Bond movies. It had a pretty topical plot for the moment, involving Glasnost, the end of the Cold War, and the war on drugs, plus the Russian war in Afghanistan. Nowadays, the film doesn't get a ton of play for similar reasons to Rambo 3, as it involves Bond teaming up with the Mujahideen, which eventually gave way to a radical splinter group, the Taliban and Osama bin Laden. 
Still, however, one needs to consider the era this film was made in, and it's a real shame that The Living Daylights has kind of been forgotten by people, as it's actually a rock-solid James Bond movie, albeit with a more earthbound approach than anyone had seen in a Bond movie for quite some time. There's a lot to recommend here with some really great action scenes and a couple of good hand-to-hand -hand scraps, plus it's got a tight pace and a more involving than usual plot, plus a surprisingly nice romance between James Bond and his leading lady, which from all accounts was something of a reaction to the ongoing AIDS crisis. You see, people in that era just had less of a taste for James Bond jumping into bed with every woman he saw when safe sex was all over the headlines. This is what I consider a real sleeper film for the franchise, and as far as I'm concerned, it's one that's ripe for rediscovery. In fact, when I was a kid, this was one of my favorite James Bond movies of all time. I vividly remember seeing it on Easter Sunday, 1990, when it made its world premiere on the ABC Sunday Night Movie. I was so excited to see this movie that apparently I woke up at 4am to watch my recorded version off of VHS and called my best friend at the time to let him know, hey, I taped the new James Bond movie. Unfortunately, it was well, 4 a.m. and I didn't quite respect the fact that his parents would probably be sleeping and that got me into a little bit of trouble. But hey, you know what? I still love this movie. Love it dearly. Now, let's break it down a little bit. The plot is kind of complicated, although I think that it was pretty solid in that they really tried to make this a gritty, grounded Bond movie. It has a lot of kind of double crosses and has a little bit in common with John le Carré. In this one, they really try to drive home the fact that James Bond is a seasoned professional who's kind of getting sick of his job. He doesn't want to kill his leading lady at the beginning, Kara, who he thinks is a KGB sniper. As he says in the film, he only kills professionals. She was no professional. I only kill professionals. Girl did no one end of a rifle from the other. You really get a feeling that Bond is getting sick of his job, even telling a fellow agent at one point that M could stuff his orders. You deliberately missed. Your orders were to kill that sniper. Stuff my orders. This was kind of a precursor to the next film in which James Bond would famously resign from the Secret Service. And I really kind of like this road they were going down with Timothy Dalton, where James Bond is just getting sick of it all. It's terrific, and they kind of picked up on that a little bit with Daniel Craig, I think. So the script is probably about a 7 on 10 because the only place where it really fails is that the villains aren't as memorable as they should have been. However, as far as James Bond goes, I have to say Dalton does a pretty solid job in his first James Bond outing. Being a Welshman, he brings a lot of gravitas to the role and I enjoyed his grittier but still suave take on Bond. My only issue with the movie is that there's a few scenes where Dalton feels like he's maybe trying too hard to be serious as Bond and seems uncomfortable with some of the comedy. In fact, Dalton always seems kind of uncomfortable when he's in a tuxedo and seems to be enjoying himself more when he's adopting the casual James Bond look, you know, when he's wearing a leather jacket or running around the city doing action scenes. In fact, I'd say the movie really gets good once he gets to Afghanistan and it becomes kind of more of a typical action movie of the era. Dalton seemed very comfortable in action films, but playing the suave side of James Bond is not something I think he was extremely well suited for, pun intended. However, I'd still give him an 8 on 10 because I like Dalton a lot. The villains, however, are a bit problematic. While I like this film, they were kind of weak. Yaron Krabbe as Koskoff was probably the main villain, but he's not the least bit threatening. He's so likable. He's got this smile on his face throughout the movie. He's so likable, in fact, they don't even kill him off at the end. They just kind of let him go. He gets arrested, but he'll probably be okay. Joe Don Baker is the more threatening one with him playing Brad Whitaker, an arms dealer, but he has pretty much no screen time. He has three scenes. That's about it. So he's not really a primary villain. So Koskoff is, by all accounts, the main villain and he's a weak one. We do have Andreas Wynerski as Necros, the KGB assassin stalking Bond throughout, but he's really more of a henchman than a true villain. But he's got a couple of really wicked fight scenes, and he looks amazing when this guy was really built, and is definitely a worthy foe to James Bond. My problem with his part though is that it's very obvious he was a loop for the role, and does indeed look a little bit too much like a European male model, which he actually was. I mean, there's a scene where he's kind of like lounging around in a skimpy bathing suit, which, you know, seems like it was plucked off of a Playgirl calendar. If you recognize Winerski, by the way, he was also Alexander Goodenough's brother in Die Hard. Drop it, dickhead. It's the police. And he's also shown up in a couple of the Mission Impossible movies as one of Max's associates. I give the villains about a 6 on 10. The Bond girl, Mariam Dabo, as Kira Malovi, I like quite a bit. She plays a Russian cellist who gets totally suckered in by Yaron Krabby's Koskov. She falls in love with him, he uses her. She gets a lot of screen time and she's quite likable and endearing and has nice chemistry with Timothy Dalton. I'd give her about an eight on 10. 
The Bond music in this one is terrific. John Barry is back and he provides a solid James Bond score. Now, in a concession to the era, there's a lot of synthesizers being used on the soundtrack, which is something that they had never really done before in the Bond franchise. But John Barry kind of makes it work. It's definitely a very 80s sounding score, much more than any of the other scores that he wrote for the series. But I really like it and it plays really well. The action scenes are quite exciting and at times it almost sounds like a Rambo movie. I really like it. The theme song, also very 80s, is by Norwegian One Hit Wonders, AHA. Yes, AHA, the guys who did Take On Me. I kind of like AHA. Their live acoustic performance of Take On Me that came out and made the rounds of YouTube a couple of years ago is really, really good. I mean, these guys are talented. But apparently, John Barry had a really, really lousy time working with them. So much so that he actually decided to retire from the series after this movie. So, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't just the AHA, but uh, John Barry didn't seem very happy when this was over. And indeed, this would be his swan song for James Bond, but luckily it's a pretty good score. I give it about a 9 on 10. Now, as it's Timothy Dalton and they're trying to make him a more serious James Bond, he's a lot less randy in this film. He only actually really hooks up with one woman in the film. Mariam Dabo is Kara Malovi. Although you do get the feeling that maybe following the teaser at the beginning of the movie, he's going to hook up with that hot lady on the yacht. Won't you join me? Better make that too. He has some good one-liners though, and there's a really cool fight scene where they're hanging on a cargo net, him and Necros, that's full of opium. He eventually gains the upper hand, and when the villain is left hanging onto his boot for dear life, he proceeds to slowly cut the shoelaces in a cold-blooded moment that's amongst the toughest in the series. The villain falls to his death, and when he returns to the cockpit, Hera asks, what happened? To which Bond perfectly replies, He got the boot. In the way of gadgets, there's not a lot here because, again, they were trying to make it a much more serious Bond movie. But he's got a beautiful car. Just taking the Aston Martin out for a quick spin cue. Be careful, 007. It's just had a new coat of paint. And a nifty little keychain that releases stun gas when you whistle into it. Stun gas. Now, the movie was relatively successful when it opened at the box office. People seem to think that Timothy Dalton's movies were disastrous, but actually The Living Daylights was kind of a hit, pulling in about $50 million in the US, which was about the same as what A View to a Kill had made a couple of years earlier, and it made $140 million worldwide off of a $30 million budget, which was very profitable, enough so that they decided to continue with Timothy Dalton. Again, I really enjoy this movie. I think it's a super solid James Bond movie, and it's got a ton of really good action scenes. I especially love the teaser how they kind of set up these different actors that look like past James Bonds to potentially be our new James Bond only to pull this heroic reveal of Timothy Dalton climbing a cliff while the agents are being killed. It's really good and it ends up culminating in a really cool fight scene where he's fighting a KGB assassin on top of a truck that's loaded with explosives. It's really cool and just one of the many awesome action scenes in this movie including a really cool car chase even though it gets bogged down a little bit in the gadgets and seems a little silly for Timothy Dalton to be completely honest. I I really enjoy this movie. It's one that I watched over and over and over again as a kid, so I give it a strong 9 on 10, although I will admit that some of that may be nostalgic value. Of course, things would take a much darker turn for Timothy Dalton in his next go-round as James Bond, but we'll get to that in the next installment, as that's a story for another time. Thank you for watching James Bond Revisited. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support.